What's up, guys? Laura Whitmore here, owner of Strategic Test Prep. I have been a test prep instructor for 16 years now, and I super score a 1570 on the SAT. So guys, the June test is right around the corner. So exciting. It's the last test of the school year, which means that there's going to be new concepts folded in coming in August. So this is your last opportunity to take a test that is going to be designed similarly to the other tests so far this school year. Now, if you're new to my channel, welcome. I'm so happy to have you. Make sure you hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss out on really helpful future content for me. And also comment below. I want to know where you're at. How many tests have you done? How far off are you from your goal? What are you thinking and feeling going into this June test. I'm really excited to hear from you. All right, let's get into the top 10 concepts that I think are going to be on the June test this year. So let's start with number one. Make sure you understand what a no solution equation looks like and an infinitely many solution equation looks like. So just as a reminder, you guys, a no solution equation has the same coefficients on both sides of the equation and different constants. I'll put an example up right now so you can see it. This is a no solution because when you go to combine like terms, the x's cancel out and then you're left with constants that don't equal each other. Like five will never equal negative seven. So there's no solution. An infinitely many equation has the same exact thing on both sides. So if your coefficients are the same and your constants are the same, then they're exactly the same. And so anything is gonna work for x. So there's infinitely many. Now, you also should know a no solution and infinitely many system and what that looks like. So just a heads up with a no solution system, your X's and Y's will cancel out and you'll be left with, you know, just a constant on the other side. So zero will never equal that other number. With an infinitely many solution system, you'll basically have two equations that are the same exact line. One will just be in proportion to each other. So maybe one line is five times bigger than the other line, but when you go to graph them, they literally graph as the same line. All right, number two, interpret a exponential growth or decay function. So it's really important to know all the parts of an exponential function. So basically the equation is y equals p and then in parentheses one plus or minus r to the t, where p stands for the principal, that's the initial amount, r stands for the rate, and then T stands for the time, and the time is typically in years. So for example, if I put up an equation that says 500 times 0.87 to the 12th, I know that this is an exponential decay problem because the number in the parentheses is less than one. My decay rate is 13% because it actually went down 13% or 13% was taken away to get the 0.87. I know 12 years have gone by and I know I started with 500. So they will ask some kind of variation of that. Now, if they say something like it happens every 12 years, well, then you need to make sure your exponent is divided by 12 because if it only happens once every 12 years, you have to actually divide the exponent into 12s to get each iteration. All right, the next concept is using the discriminant. Now, if you are given a quadratic equation, and by the way, you'll know it's a quadratic because your highest exponent is a two, they might ask you about the number of real solutions. So if you see that phrase asking about the number of real solutions, that's your sign that you need to use the discriminant, which is b squared minus 4ac. It's basically the part under the square root of the quadratic. If b squared minus 4ac is negative, you will have no real solutions. If b squared minus 4ac equals zero, you will have one real solution. And if b squared minus 4ac is positive, you'll have two real solutions. Okay, number four is the complementary angles rule. Now, there's not much trig on this test. Make sure you understand so Katoa, you know, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent opposite over adjacent. But besides that, the biggest thing that they test is the complementary angles rule, which basically states if two angles are complementary, then the sine of one of the angles will equal the cosine of the other angle. So if they tell you angles A plus B equals 90 and sine of A is three fifths, then you know cosine of B is also three fifths because A and B add to 90, the complementary angles rule. This was something that they just asked about on the May test that was just released. 
all these concepts I've covered so far have shown up on the May test as well. So be ready for that one. That'll probably be on June. All right, number five, they're gonna ask you to find the y-intercept of an exponential function. Now guys, an exponential function has that curve to it where it shoots up, right? So if they want the y-intercept, you just have to keep in mind on any graph, no matter what type of function it is, your x value on the y-axis is always zero. So you'll just plug in zero for x and solve for y, and that'll tell you what the y-intercept is, even of an exponential function. All right, number six, absolute value expressions. Now, with absolute value expression equations, you're going to end up most of the time with two solutions. Because when you go to solve an absolute value expression, you actually write two equations. You take off the absolute values, and then you have one equation set equal to the positive answer and the other equation set equal to the negative answer. Just be careful because if they have an absolute value expression equal to a negative number, there will be no solutions to that because you can never get a negative value when you solve an absolute value expression. So that's like one of their little trick curveball questions. And I just want you guys to be ready for worst case scenarios. And that being said, before we get to the next concept, that's something I want you guys to keep in mind for June. It really is an advantage to take the June test because of what I said before. The concepts have been pretty much the same all year. And so you're going to be fully prepared for June if you've practiced the other recent tests. And by the way, I just updated my online self-paced SAT course so that it has the most recent concepts and material in there. So if you feel like you need a last minute push, then you can take my course and do the parts that you really think you need to focus on. And that might get you where you need to be. Going back to what I was just saying, the June test can also be a disadvantage because the SAT likes to kind of change the questions and throw in some curveballs. So there might be a little bit more trickiness to some of these standard questions that we've seen with absolute values or um, exponential functions. So just be very careful and make sure you read every single question very carefully and proceed with caution because they're going to try to trick you, I'm sure, on this next test. Speaking of being tricked, on the May test, they started to throw some curveballs when it came to percent change. So usually you just need to know, like, if they ask you for a percent increase or decrease the percent change formula, which is the change divided by the original amount times 100. Now, what they started doing on the May was they asked, uh, they would say, oh, it's 190% greater. So what is the new amount? Now, because of the word greater thrown in there, you're not finding 100, 190% of whatever number they're talking about. A lot of my students took like the number like a thousand and multiplied it by 1.9 and then put an answer of 1900. But since it's 190% greater, that means it's 190% bigger than the original amount. So you have to add 190% of the original amount to the original amount. So the answer to one of the questions on the May was actually 2,900, not 1,900, just because of the tricky way the problem was worded. All right, the next concept is the sum of solutions of a quadratic. I am in love with this trick. I will, you know, uh, promote this trick till the cows come home. I am telling you guys, it is so juicy. If they give you a quadratic, which they've been doing all year, and they ask for the sum of the solutions, it's a negative B over A. That's all you have to do. All right, number nine, you need to know the circle equation. So know the format of a circle equation, okay? So if I have x plus two squared plus y minus five squared equals 16, I have to change the signs of the numbers in the parentheses. So my center would be at negative two, five, and then what it equals is radius squared. So my radius is going to be four. Now, one curveball they threw in the May test is you know, they put a point on the circle. So you weren't given the radius. You actually had to find the length of the radius. So that means you guys should know the distance formula too, which was a concept that they tested before they redesigned the SAT in 2016. And it hasn't really been relevant. So distance is D equals a square root of parentheses x2 minus x1 squared plus parentheses y2 minus y1 squared. I know that that's a little tricky to remember. You can always program it into your graphing calculator because they don't make you erase your memory and then you can look it up. 
Or what you can do is just remember that it's more negative than positive to remember the distance formula. So just make sure you know it goes minus plus minus. But on that one on the May test, you could use the distance formula to get the length of the radius. And it turns out the length of the radius was square root of 10. So that means that your circle equation would equal 10 because it's R squared, not R. All right, last but not least, conversion problems. Make sure you understand how to tackle a square unit conversion problem. So what you'll want to do is make sure you square whatever conversion units they give you to get them in square form. And then you can start to um, basically multiply with what you need to multiply by to get your final answer. So those are really tricky because they give you conversion units that are one dimensional and you really have to convert them to two dimensional or maybe even it will be a three dimensional volume thing on your test where you'll have to cube both sides of the conversion first. So then you can use that. All right, guys. So that concludes this video. Those are my top 10 concepts that I am pretty confident will be on the June test. I could probably bet money on it. I might even give away my firstborn child. Just kidding. But I'm pretty confident that um, these will be on there. So thank you so much for watching. If you made it to the end of this video, comment below 1600 because I'm telling you, like if you made it to the end of this video, you are a score of 1600 in my heart and I appreciate you. And yep, until next time guys, happy prepping.